The last item in this topic is project network and analysis. So, here we have a network representation of a project. A project typically consists of several steps. Some steps or activities can be performed in series, some have to can be performed in parallel. Okay. So, uh, so this, this project itself has a bunch of activities and uh, these activities can some of them can be performed in parallel whereas some of them need to be completed before starting other activities. I will try to explain that with an example in a short while. So, a project itself uh, as an example will be let us say you have a college event, okay, a cultural event for example and you and a bunch of your friends are uh, there. Uh, who have a little drawing of the structure that you need to make for uh, that you need to build. Okay? So, you need to build a structure for an event in your college and uh, you and your team uh, sit down and write down all the activities. So, what do you need to do first? Well, first you need to brainstorm okay, with your team and figure out how am I going to build this structure? How are we going to build the structure as a team? Then what happens is the team splits into two groups. One group goes and gets the raw material for the structure and another group goes and works on the artwork. So, the structure has a physical form, okay, so that has to be engineered first and on top of that you need to put some art. Okay. So, the art uh, raw material and the structural raw material can be done in parallel and once they are all made, so what happens is uh, the, the art, the, these can be done in parallel and then once both of them are ready, we can sit down and plan. Okay. So, uh, we take stock of what is available because many times you know you can plan only fi after figuring out what we have with us. Okay? So, you go and pick art material, you go pick structural material and put everything together and sit down and come back for another round of brainstorming You try and plan what to do. Uh, the structural team perhaps will build a structure again that can happen in parallel while the art team creates artwork uh, again in parallel and then puts it on the structure. Now, once everything is ready we meet together, go up to the venue and assemble the art on the structure. So, create the structure, assemble it uh, and then create the art and then put it on top of the structure, put it all together and you will be done. Now, everything that I just said can be put down in a network form. Okay, so, you start with node A. So, these nodes and letters in the nodes do not mean much. They just denote when an activity starts and when an activity ends. There are other ways of representing project activities. We will not go into that. Uh, so, this is a network and it goes in one direction, you start at A and end at J and that process what happens is we go through multiple arcs and each arc tells you what activities there are. So, the first activity is to brainstorm uh, which all the team members have to be there. Then the art team goes and picks art material and then they would move the art material down to the place where they are going to discuss. Similarly, the structural hardware and the tools that are needed are brought together. Now, we have all the materials E. So, once we have everything with us, so we have to wait when either this or this whichever happens last, we wait for that to happen. Then we sit down and plan. So, why at the end of the planning process, we are saying okay, now we have two pieces. Now, the art guys can go ahead and start to pencil draw the art, paint the art and then be done. Likewise, the structural folks can build the lower structure and then they build the upper structure, the two parts of the structure and then they are done. Now, when once everything is done, they bring it to the venue and then they take time to assemble it. Then once everything is assembled, we are done. So, notice that there are some tasks that can be done in parallel. There are some tasks that can, are to be done in series, in other words have to wait. For example, to start planning, you have to wait to be done with both the other parts. To start assembling, you have to wait for both the art and the structure to be ready. Okay? So, these are some of the constraints. Now, this type of problem falls under what is called PERT. PERT means Program Evaluation Review Technique. Okay? So, let us say uh, you need to manage a project that has never been done before. Now, this is a very important part of PERT. It is not like I have tons of prior data. Think about this project like this. Each of us will probably get chance once in your entire college career to do a project like that. So, it is very important to realize that this is not a repeated type of situation. This is one in which the project has never been done before. So, uh, what we do is we are thinking about putting down this project in a formal fashion in terms of a network to see how we can analyze. And uh, the activities also have never been done before, at least uh, not by the people who are pursuing the activities. So, therefore, we do not have any historical data. 
Okay, so now this is again back to a situation where we're saying, okay, we don't have any data, we don't know, we've never done this before, then what do you do? Well, we are not going to be completely, um, you know, uh, what's called non-parametric. We are going to have some parametric uh, estimates. For example, we are going to say, well, I could at least guess what's the fastest I can do this. That's what's called optimistic. Or what's most likely how long it's going to take me. Or what's the pessimistic estimate, the worst case. So I have three numbers, A, M, and B. A is the smallest, next is M, next is B. A is the optimistic, what's the fastest I can do this. Uh, B is the pessimistic, what's the worst case uh, time that it will take. And M is somewhere in between, it's the most likely time. Okay? So usually, the I'm sorry, the graph usually looks kind of like this, like this. This is A, this is M, the mode of the distribution and that's the reason it has an M. Now, uh, we assume that this distribution is what's called beta or beta, beta distribution. Now, when we use the beta distribution in the previous topic, there were only two parameters. Now we have three. That's because this is what's called a three parameter beta, a uh, parameter distribution, beta distribution, A, M, and B. In the two parameter distribution, basically the B, M and B were such that, I'm sorry, the B and A were such that B minus A was equal to one or something like that. It's a special case. Uh, and you know, and this is a more general case. I, 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 I like this a little bit better than what I presented earlier. So we need to make the following decision. We want to figure out what deadline to propose. Okay, what should I tell the person who wants the project to be completed uh, as to when they should show up? Okay, when they show up, I want to be 95% sure of completing the project. So that means you know, there's a very, very high light high chance that I'd be done by the time the person comes and says, uh, is it ready? Okay, this is an important aspect and we want to be sure that you want to provide good service to your client, if you will. Now, the PERT approximation uses the following steps. There are five steps. The first step in the PERT analysis says, we are going to use the beta distribution for the activity times. Really, it, it, the beta part is not important. The reason we use the beta part is if I know this A, M, and B, I can compute the mean and the variance of the activity time. So if you look at, look at it here, how long is it going to take me to brainstorm? I can compute the mean and the variance of that time. That's all I really need it for. So I compute the mean using this A plus 4M plus B, the whole thing divided by 6 and the variance as b minus a the whole square divided by 36. So that's how I compute the mean and the variance. So once we do that, the beta part is gone. There's no, no need for that. Now the next thing we do is we compute what's called the critical path. This is the longest path from the start to finish. Okay? So this is the longest path from a to j. Why do we pick the longest path? Well, that's the time that it's going to take uh, you know, uh, if, if you think about it. So for example, if the artwork gets done faster than the structure, you still have to wait till the longer arc gets done, right? The structural part for you to start activity E. So the total time is going to be the time along the longest path. Now the path times are also random, unlike the standard shortest path problem that we, some of you may have seen. Now, turns out that we are going to next assume now this is a major assumption which is that the project time equals the sum of the activity times on the critical path. So it's only the critical path uh, So and the critical path is computed using the mean values, okay, the average values. So it could so be that you know, the average value, could, the one that has a smaller average could take longer sometimes. See, remember we looked a lot, of, uh, a lot at those kind of things, we'll see that again in the next topic. Uh, however, you know, as a decent approximation, we say that among the average times, take the one that takes longer. Then we use the central limit theorem that we saw last time in uh, topic one and say that, well, the project completion time is going to be normally distributed with means equal to the sum of the means along the critical path and variance is equal to sum of the variance along the critical path. So remember the critical path is assumed to be the time and it's the sum of a bunch of other times. And remember when you add up a bunch of independent random variables, the resulting random variable is normally distributed if you had a lot of them. And then we say, okay, therefore the distribution is uh, according to normal using central limit theorem. And then we will say, okay, what is the 95th percentile of the project completion time? 
Let us do a little example using PERT. So, we are going to take a network that is shown here and the this is somewhat of a small network. The reason it is small is so that I can show you all the steps and tell you how these things are done. The numbers on the arcs are three values. The first value is A, the optimistic estimate, M, the most likely activity time and B, the pessimistic activity time. So, think of those are the are the times, they could be in minutes or they could be in hours depending on the problem. Uh, I guess in this case it is days, I am sorry I did not look at that, it is in days, so it is a number of days it is going to take me to do this. So, uh, so the values A, M and B are the optimistic most likely and pessimistic values. Now, we are going to use the beta distribution and we are going to compute the mean and variance of the activity times. Okay? I am going to erase these numbers and instead what I am going to do is I am going to write down the mean and the variance values on top of the arc. So, if you remember the mean equals A plus 4 M plus B divided by 6 and the variance is B minus A the whole squared divided by 36. <coughs> okay. So, now if you uh, if you look at this, the first one the mean is going to be 4 that is because 1 plus 16 plus 7. So, 7 plus 1 is 8, 8 and 16 is 24, 24 over 6 is 4 and then the variance is B minus A 6, 6 times 6 is 36. So, this is the mean and the variance. So, this number is the mean, this number is the variance. Likewise, I go here and I can compute the mean as 5 that is because 5 times 4 is 20, 20 plus 10 is 30, 30 over 6 is 5, 8 minus 2 is 6, 6 over 6 is 1, so 1 square is 1. Likewise, 21 times 4 plus 36 divided by 6 and that is equal to 7 times 2 plus 6, so that is 20. And uh, 30 minus 6 is uh, uh, 24, 24 over 6 is 4, 4 times 4 is 16. Okay. Now, uh, we will look at this, this one mean is 6 and the standard deviation variance is 1 and standard deviation is 1 as well. Here uh, if you look at this here, 5 times 4 is 20 plus 16 is 36 over 6 is 6 and this one is 4 because 14 minus 2 is 12, uh, 12 uh, Uh, oops, let me just let me just erase this and rewrite this. Okay, so 12 square uh, is 144 divided by 36 is 4. Uh, likewise, if we go ahead and write down the other numbers as well, I'm going to go to the next slide and I show you uh, what the actual numbers look like. So we saw that 4 1 here, we saw 5 1 here, uh, 2016 we saw this, I believe we saw 6 1, and a few others, right? 1 and 6, 4 and 6, 4. These are the numbers we saw. You can compute and check all these other numbers. Okay. Now, uh, remember that we have only used the beta distribution to compute the mean and the variance. Okay. There is after that we do not need the beta business. So, we can let that aside. Now, what happens is now let us look at all the numbers there. There are two numbers on each arc. One number is the mean, the other number is the variance. So, we want to look and see which is the critical path. So, let us look at all the possible paths. I am going to illustrate all the paths. So, one path is this. Uh, I am going to pick another color for the second path. Oh, I may pick a different color. The second path is this. And then the third path, let me pick a color like this. The, the third path is this. Then there is a fourth path which is and there is only four, four possible paths and these let us take orange and the fourth path is this. Okay. So, in the red path the total the, the expected value is 4 plus 5 9 plus 20 29 plus 9 38 39 40 50. So, that is 50. Uh, the second path which is in violet. If you look at it, it is 6 plus 4, 10 uh, plus 13, 23, 23 plus uh, 9 is 32, 44. 
<coughs> then the third path in orange, the things add to 4 plus 6, 10 and 10, 29, 31, 41. And finally, the green path is 6 plus 4, 10 and, and uh, ooh, I need to erase that and see what number that, oh, maybe I can, okay, that is 16, okay, good, 16. So, uh, 10 and 16 is 26 and 9 is 35, 47. So, the longest path is A, B, C, F, H, I. So, that the red path is indeed the longest, okay. This is the red one the one in red <coughs> and the length is 50 which which is written here and the standard deviation is square root of 31 how did we get that well we have on the red path we have the variance equals 1 plus 1 plus 16 remember the variance add up so plus 4 plus 9 i believe so that's equal to 16 20 22 and 31 so the variance is 31 so standard deviation is square root of 31 okay is square root of 31 days <coughs> now i'm going to do a little bit of the software uh, situation and i'm going to show you in two ways that the 95th percentile uh, is um, going to be 59.19 days there are two ways of doing this uh, if you recall, one way is to say that the probability that the random variable x is less than or equal to little x, we want that to be 0.95. In other words, we want the probability that z, the standard normal, which is x minus 50 divided by square root of 31, we want that to be 0.95. And we know that the 95th percentile of the standard normal is 1.65. So, x minus 50 divided by square root of 31 is 1.65. If we use this and solve for x, we will get x equals 59.19 days. And that is because this 1.65 gets multiplied by square root of 31 and you add a 50, that is my value of little x. So, you should promise 59.19 days. So, typically as a manager, you would say I will give you the item, uh, I will deliver the project within 60 days to be 95 percent sure. Okay, so, that is what PERT essentially does for you, it tells you the probability of finishing uh, in, in 60 days is this. Now, I am going to use a little demo, it is a very straightforward demo uh, in Octave uh, before we uh, wrap up. So, this code is to generate the inverse normal CDF. Remember, we want to compute the inverse of the CDF because uh, we, we do not want the random, we do not want the probabilities, but we want its inverse. Uh, you can type the command norm inv to compute the inverse of the normal. Uh, we could have just directly used the function norm inverse, but we are going to take a couple of steps. The first step is, so I want to first compute, if you just write norm inv of 0.95, what you would get is the 95th percentile of the standard normal. Instead, uh, which, we, which we saw earlier in this slide was 1.65, which will probably be a little bit less than that. 1.65 is generally considered as a nice rounded up number. Instead, you could have not even gone the standard normal route. You could have just said, well, I will just go ahead and take the inverse normal of a distribution with mean 50 days and standard deviation square root of 31 days. I could have just done that and written down the project completion time. So, let us go ahead and do that and so this file is called norminv.m. So, I do norminv.m. So, n o r m underscore i n v. So, that is the name of the file. So, if you look at this, it says uh, the, uh, uh, if you look at this, the standard normal 95th percentile is 1.6449 we used 1.65 in our calculation and the project completion time is 59.16 that is the project completion time. So, I could basically what I am doing is I am directly computing this without even worrying about the standard normal. But if we do the standard normal route which is very common in most textbooks because years ago they did not have this kind of software and so everybody used the standard normal table and computed this. If you did that which is what is presented here then it would take 59.19. But if you directly use the software you would get that same result without going through this whole business of standard normal. I just wanted to mention that but please feel free to play with this because 
this day and age, it's a good idea to just use some of the software to directly give you these values without worrying too much about the notion of standard normal. Okay, I will stop here and uh, thank you very much. Next class, we will uh, see the next topic. Thank you.